Welcome. It's uh, <laughs> a very warm welcome to everyone uh, here this morning. I think uh, we've broken an India-wide record by having a full house before 11 o'clock. <laughs> and then I thought, for all of those who would show up at 11 05, let's just wait for five extra minutes and be kind. But it goes to show uh, how uh, enthusiastic everyone is. Uh, you couldn't have two more provocative people to speak on the Indian economy in the room. Uh, and it's uh, so thank you both Lant and Ajay for agreeing to be here. Today's talk is particularly special for us at CPR, not just because uh, we undoubtedly are going to be provoked, entertained, and made to think very hard uh, through the course of this morning, but also because uh, Lant is an old friend of CPR's and has, is very familiar in this conference room. In fact, I think the first time I came to CPR, uh, when, back in the day, was when you were here giving a talk on education. It says something about the state of India that that talk is still relevant. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Uh, but uh, he, Lant has been uh, an intellectual mentor, supporter, friend to many of us at CPR and especially me. Uh, and it is uh, a real privilege for us that we get to host him today, not just as our friend and mentor, but also now officially as a friend and part of CPR's family. He is a visiting fellow at CPR and we couldn't be prouder of that. So thank you very much, Lan, for agreeing to be part of uh, the CPR family and, and now uh, with us in the CPR journey, where we hope that at least in the next 10 years, that presentation you gave here in 2005 will no longer be valid and we'll be moving forward and onward. Um, but uh, uh, it's a real privilege for us, and thank you very much, Ajay. I think we met too in the good old days when Land was making that presentation, uh, and a lot of what the, those conversations that we had back then have both influenced and shaped a lot of the work that we do here at CBR, and we hope to continue that as we go forward, uh, being provoked and supported by both of you. So over to you, Land. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and uh, it's nice to be in a room of many familiar faces. Um, and I want to, the title today is India's Economy in a Whole Keep Digging. Um, it is not going to be focused particularly on what has been happening in the last six to 12 months in the Indian economy. It's going to be more focused on providing kind of some conceptual ways of thinking about economic growth and kind of how one thinks about where in India's current more general predicament than just the current uh, incipient slowdown. But I think it is also very relevant to the current uh, incipient and ongoing slowdown and how one thinks about getting out of that. So I want to start with kind of four big concepts though and make sure that kind of create some common vocabulary for discussing um, uh, economic growth because often economic growth uh, immediately gets into what would be the right policies or something about institutions. And I'm going to argue that most of the ways of talking about policies and institutions are nonsense um, and really don't get you anywhere productive about thinking about economic growth. So first. Um, I want to emphasize that, you know, this is an attempt to integrate work that is uh, starting at CPR and has been ongoing for some time at CPR about state capability with discussions about economic growth because people often think state capability is about education and health and procurement and economic growth is about an entirely different set of factors but I want to emphasize that there's a cl close link and one of the things that low state capability for policy implementation means is facts or fiction. Um, the essence of having low capability is you lose control of the facts. And so what the facts on which one would implement policy are manipulable themselves and manipulated. And hence, uh, without facts, uh, one policy as in a de jure sense simply becomes irrelevant for reasons I'll talk about. Second concept is that beautiful law destroys the rule of law. Um, so a lot of the attempt to kind of create good things in India has focused on creating good laws 
but I'm going to make an argument, which is on the way to another argument, that it's precisely the adoption of good law that leads to the undermining of rule of law and its difficult its creation. Um, and then these lead to that weak state capability means that ultimately the economy is not driven by rules, but is driven by deals. And it's the structure of deals and their evolution that really determines the performance of the economy in a way that has little or nothing to do with either policies in the de jure sense or with good or improved institutions. So none of the explanation of why countries have had growth episodes really hinges around good institutions or improved institutions um, uh, in, a, in an immediate sense. And then finally, it's the locus of the deals across sectors of the economy that determines long run economic growth. So who gets good deals and why? Um, is going to determine the duration with which good deals can generate growth and the magnitude of the catastrophe that happens when growth stops. So let me get right into that. Fact is fiction. Why not start with a bold introduction? Fact is fiction. Um, the, the, the essence of a policy, you know, the word policy is in the title of this organization. People talk about policy reform all the time. But policy is a mapping from states of the world to actions by agents. That's the really core definition of a policy, is that an agent is designated to take some action that's contingent on observing some state of the rule, world. So if I'm a regulatory agency and I'm regulatory, regulating the environment, I observe some state of the world about your firm's emissions, and I take an action contingent on that fact. So kind of what state capability means is two different th concepts. One is making sure the actions by the ac agents of the state actually comply with the realized states of the world. And another is that they actually take the right actions that lead to the intended outcomes. Those could be um, exactly the same, by the way, if the policy is right. But often, the actions by the agent of the state produce better outcomes than mere compliance with the policy would have. So we don't want to completely conflate the notion of capability and compliance, but compliance is one notion of capability. So let me skip that. Let me skip that. Let me skip that. Let me go to this. I, so I'm going to skip a lot of slides. Um, I have students here in the room who remember. I would, I, I, I would say, oh, these slides would change your life if you saw them, but I'm skipping them. Um, <laughs> So I'm skipping slides because a lot of times I have three or four slides to illustrate the same point. I think this is a paper by um, Rohini Pandey and other people. Um, this is a Harvard style of citation. We cite our colleagues and everybody else is at or all. We don't really care. So Rohini Pandey and others did this paper where they looked at the actual implementation of environmental regulation in India in which firms hired third-party firms to audit their emissions, and then those were reported to the regulator. And this was the distribution of emissions that was reported in the you know, pre-intervention stage. And you know, the interesting thing about this is um, the emissions were concentrated just below the legal limit. So nearly everybody reported that their emissions were right below the legal limit. Now, the interesting thing is this is the actual data of the reality of emissions. And what's amazing about this distribution is that not only were the polluting firms lying, that they were, had much higher emissions, but the non-polluting firms were lying too. So there were all kinds of firms with much less emission, but they basically said, what the hell? I don't want to attract attention to myself because they might be suspicious if I report too low. Let's just concentrate. And so nearly all of the data was right below the line, whereas almost no firm was really there. So the point is, is that if you had hired a consultant to help you improve your policy about emissions, and they had been given this data as the facts of the world about firm emissions, those facts are a complete and total fiction. They don't represent the reality. They're not systematically underestimated, they're just nothing to do with the actual reality. And 
There are just lots and lots of examples of this. I like to show this because this was an early attempt to um, get uh, banks where all banks were required to offer a low, uh, a zero cost account. Um, and uh, a student of mine did a study where they sent in mystery shoppers to see if they were offered the account. So this is, I'm giving this example because this isn't the public sector. This is compliance of both public banks and private banks. And what was interesting is <laughs> the, the private banks were much better at offering people a high balance account, whereas the state banks didn't even bother to do that. But um, this blue bar of actually being offered the legally mandated low balance account is not in fact missing from the graph. It just never happened. It was just zero. Nobody pitching themselves up in a bank was voluntarily offered this low balance account, which was legally mandated to be offered. And even when they asked for it, only about 20 of the firms would even admit it was a possibility, even though, again, it was legally mandated that every firm do it. So again, <laughs> the facts about everything about the public sector, attendance, compliance, are a complete fiction. So, so in that sense, the de jure policy, and so what happens with low capability for state implementation is not primarily that the agents don't do what the facts say they should do. They misrepresent the facts. And misrepresenting the facts is much more corrosive than noncompliance but admitting what the facts are, because once the facts are misstated, you don't have any basis on which to take action. So, um, and let me hop back to this, one of my favorite slides, um, which is you know, an early RCT um, uh, of our Nobel Prize winner, uh, American Abhishek Banerjee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was Indira Rajaram that pointed out he was American, not me. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, shouldn't, shouldn't tease about things like that. Um, Bengali, let's settle on that. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, one of their early studies was to try and in induce auxiliary nurse wives to be more present in clinics. And what they found is in the control group relative to the treatment, the, in the treatment group relative to the control group over time, is that recorded absence fell from about 25% to less than 10%. Because they were putting pressure that you wouldn't get paid if you were absent. But physical presence fell from 45 to 30%. And you might think, well, either they're present or they're absent. Ha, 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 you haven't worked in the Indian bureaucracy. Uh, they were neither absent, nor were they actually there to provide health services. They were exempt from duty. And if you were exempt from duty, then the absence didn't count against your getting paid, but it also meant you weren't actually there to provide any services. And physically, if you pitched up a clinic, you were even less likely to find a nurse under this new attempt to improve control but you had lost control of the facts. Or moreover, the administrative facts were now that absence was no longer a problem. And so the government was literally saying, oh, we're at 9% absence. We're reaching international best practice levels of nurse absence. There isn't a nurse absence problem anymore. And administratively, on the facts that were fiction, they were right. But the fact on the ground was they weren't there. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good to see you. Okay, so the second, and I'm gonna go over this very quickly because I'm just kind of throwing this in because it's new and interesting and I love it. Um, and it has some relationship to the topic of hand is that beautiful law destroys the rule of law. Um, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is, um, and I'm gonna start with a little story. Um, uh, I had a friend who was asked by a friend of his who had just gotten married the friend's wife had a cat that she had loved for many, many years named Duke. And Duke was a particularly, even among cats, a particularly non-person cat, so hated everybody. So they had a hard time finding somebody to take care of Duke. So his best friend said, we're going to go on a honeymoon for a week. I need to reassure my wife that someone will take care of Duke. Will you come take care of Duke? So he flies out to LA, 
the friends have gone on the honeymoon. He shows up after his days at work. He opens the door, and this tabby cat shoots out the door. Runs away. He chases. He calls Duke, Duke, Duke. Hours. It's 10 o'clock at night. He can't fight Duke. He said, I'm, I'm giving up. He goes to bed. He wakes up in the morning. He opens the door, and a tabby cat strolls in. He says, oh, Duke, you're back. He feeds Duke. And during the week, he takes very good care of Duke, and Duke warms up to him. And he's like, Duke is really nice to him. And he's like, this is great. Um, you know, I, I've like cracked the code of how to get Duke to be nice to me. And so he flew off, and his friends got back from their honeymoon, and he said, how is the, how's Duke? I, I, I got along great with him. He's in good shape. And he says, well, turns out the cat that's there is in very good shape. It's just not Duke. Um, uh, so he had taken care of a cat that happened to stroll in and decided to uh, have a good time. So the point of this, <laughs> you might wonder, other than being a great anecdote, is you only have to be wrong about one thing. <laughs> Once you were wrong about which cat it was, all of your other effort was like, didn't have any positive impact, right? So, um, when we think of the, uh, one way of uh, thinking of how things work is that we've got a good thing like policy and then we've got some other good thing like actual implemented practices and the dynamics of these kind of go together and so we can force these dynamics in either dimension and so if we just adopt good policy that'll create this dynamic pressure and I've kind of drawn in a crudely stupid face space diagram just because I remember one from school, I can't really do the map anymore. But so there's some phase space in which there's a uniformly equilibrating dynamic. And so if you adopt big, bold new laws, that'll create pressure for the practices to follow the law, and you'll get to good outcomes. Whereas <clears throat> there's a recent book by um, uh, by Asimoglu and Robinson that um, I think has a great title and some interesting concepts is probably mostly wrong, but other than that, it's really good. Um, but it introduces the concept of the narrow corridor, which is a wonderful phrase. And their idea is there's a narrow corridor in which there is a stable dynamics. You know, countries that have good laws have good practices, but it's actually around a very stable dynamic. And if one, in fact, adopts a great law that's way from existing practices, it doesn't create a positive dynamic, it creates a negative dynamic. So what it does is it creates the pressures such that, you know, if you have an army and you're trying to create an army, your army has its ability to inflict damage when it's not under pressure, and that is a nonlinear function of the pressure your enemy puts on your army. And at some point, your army collapses into a disorganized mob. And if you want to destroy the capability of your army, you throw the army up against an enemy that can inflict more pressure than it can withstand, and you completely destroy the capability of your army. So premature engagement of a too intense variety actually destroys capability. It doesn't build capability. And so, <clears throat> I'm skipping through. So, Amazingly, <laughs> and this is work together, we found some modest quantitative evidence that this is true. So what we do is we look at the doing business indicators, which have become famous in India. And the doing business indicators are kind of a de jure measure of the time it would take for regulatory compliance if you complied. But in many, many countries around the world, there's also an enterprise survey that asks, how much time did it actually take you? And it turns out these two numbers um, have nothing to do with each other. So this is the distribution across all of the countries that for which we have an indicator from the enterprise survey. And the median of the doing business is that it takes you 190 days according to the doing business survey to get a construction permit. Um, <laughs> a third of the firms report less than 15 days. Another third of the firms report less than 45 days. So nearly all firms actually getting permits are getting them at incredibly faster times than the de jure reported doing business uh, compliance. 
and in particularly low capability places, that's even more so. And so Sudan, Sudan, for instance, has, according to doing business, it takes 270 days to get a permit. Um, the actual reality is that everyone who got a permit got a permit in less than 15 days. So just complete. Uh, and here is the amazing interactive regression we can show. <laughs> the amazing interactive regression we can show is, um, that's the right order of the author, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, the amazing interactive regression we can show is if we say, okay, suppose you increase the law by 100 days, right? What does that do to the percent of the deals that are less than 15? Because our argument is if it takes less than 15 days, you didn't really comply in a way that enhanced the purpose of the regulation. And what happens is when your state capability is low, increasing the law increases lack of compliance. <coughs> Right? So in some sense, the increase in a regulation that said, oh, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, when it happens in a strong capability state, this is states ranked by capability, it actually you know, reduces the number of firms that get a quick permit. But when you do it in a less than four level, um, and by the way, this is, if you do it when your capability is weak, it actually increases the fraction of firms that are getting it in 15 days. So compliance becomes rare, and if you increase it from an already high level, then it leads to even more increase. So that's the sense in which um, the adoption of laws that might be best practice from Sweden or Germany or somewhere interacted with relatively low capability to actually correctly declare the state of the, state of the world is going to lead to an environment in which <laughs> there's even less compliance with the law. So rather than furthering the public purpose, you probably undermine the public purpose by adopting a set of laws that look on the face of them more favorable. So you could adopt a stronger environmental law <laughs> and actually get less environmental compliance. You could adopt higher taxes and actually collect less taxes. You could you know, mandate banks provide free accounts and actually have no effect or even negative effect on the actual fraction of, I mean, after all, if you make the accounts free, then they're like, the, you know, I mean, it's one thing to say you can open this account but charge this, and then if you move to free, you might get even less compliance. So, Good law actually destroys the rule of law if it's out of the corridor of what the practices that could actually be. So just as throwing your army into a against too strong of appointment destroys army capability rather than builds it, passing rules and regulations de jure that are far beyond the ability to capable, uh, the capability to implement them probably in the long run inhibits your ability to develop develop capable organizations because what you largely then do is you force things underground. Once you force things underground, then you can no longer kind of rely on a discussion about the facts. Moreover, you acquire preferential deals in which the people who are escaping compliance want the law to be even stronger. So if you pass a very strict environmental law, and the public enterprises don't have to comply with it, <laughs> and the private sector does, then the public sector wants even stronger environmental laws because it further disadvantages potential competitors. So you can actually get in to a situation in which it's very hard to pull the law back because the advocates in favor of the thing see that as weakening regulation, and the worst non-compliers want the law to be just as strong. So there actually isn't any pressure to make the law better. So um, the organized capability for implementation is actually weakened and destroyed. And then you get a perfect storm in which powerful vested interests and the most noble advocates advocate for retaining a law that is actually never enforced except differentially. And you end up in this perfect storm where you're in a low-level equilibrium trap. So, Idea three 
is now building from that, which is if you live in a world of low state capability for policy implementation, firms actually exist in a deals world, not a rules world. And my main distinction between a rules world and a deals world is in a deals world, if I am a firm and I am going to predict what actually is going to happen to me, it depends on me. It literally depends on who I am, what my network is politically, what my you know, characteristics of me, right? What my political affiliation is, what my actions vis-a-vis -vis compliance are, who I'm bribing, how, how much I'm bribing them. Whereas in an ideal rules world, the rules are the rules and they're not indexed by person, right? So if the queen of England plays chess, she's not the queen. The pieces move the same <laughs> for the Queen of England playing chess as they move for any other person. That's a rules world, right? And when we say rules of the game, that's kind of what we mean is that there's a set of rules of the game that aren't rules of the people. Whereas in a deals world, it's rules of the specific individuals, people's firms, and the outcomes that an investor would reasonably expect to happen to them are indexed by them. They're indexed by their connections, by their political connections, by the bribes they're paying, by the, what they're engaged in. And in this, kind of, in this kind of deals world, and this is just showing you again, the difference between the doing business and enterprise survey reveals the extent to which the official rules as measured by formal de jure policies like the doing business measures just have really nothing to do with what we see when we interview firms. Um, and this is uh, across a variety of responses where we can compare doing three different indicators where we can compare doing business um, in the sense that, you know, basically this is the distribution of the doing business indicator and this is the doing business of the firms. And basically the median firm says 30 days. And they say 30 days when the law is 90, and they say 30 days when the law is 200, 180, and they say 30 when the law is 270, and they, say, they just say 30 days, right? But moreover, and this is a graph that I would hope you would love, but I'm sure you're going to hate, um, because it's impossible to read, but it's amazingly informative, is this is every country in the world by their doing business day, and the round dot is the 10th percentile, and the triangle is the 90th percentile. So this is saying, what's the distribution within a country of the days reported by firms versus what the law says? And what you see is that the variation among firms in the same country is massively larger than the total variation in the mean. Meaning, the 10th percentile firm in this country, I have a country that I've picked out at random. The easy in Slovenia say 14. The slow in Fellini and Slovenia say 365. The total range of this difference, right, between uh, the, you know, the typical firm in the world, between the fastest typical firm in the, country, the world in the 90th percentile is actually only about 60 days. So in a very factual, graphical sense, it's not where you are, it's who you are. This is literally proof that it's not where you are, it's who you are. So if you're predicting how many days will it take me to get a permit, knowing where you are <laughs> gives you some information. <coughs> knowing who you are is much more important. Um, and by the way, since this is another graph that <clears throat> it's beautiful, but you don't know it yet. Um, <laughs> this looks at all con countries that did reform in the sense that they reduced their doing business days in order to probably please the bank and increase the ranking rather than any real other reason. But they reduced significantly in the doing business days. And we asked what actually happened to what firms reported as their actual time. And in about a third of the cases, reductions in the doing business days led to increases in the reported compliance times. And in about a third of the cases, it led to reductions. 
and about a third of the cases it led to no change. So basically reforming the law kind of makes no difference. Why? Well, it's pretty obvious. If I've already bought into, in, if in order to evade a law that would have taken me 180 days, I have bought into a relationship that gets it done in 10, and you lower the law to 90, that's a huge reform. It's still 10. <laughs> I have, why would I give up on 10? And sometimes, if you get close enough and 10, the way you were getting to 10 was expensive, you'll shift from 10 to 90. But there are lots of cases, and that's what happens here, is you actually shift from 10 to 90, right? But you've still got higher compliance times, but lots of times it has the opposite effect or it has no effect, which is the typical firm says, look, I have an, I'm embedded in a network that provides me a favorable deal. I'm sticking with a deal I have no matter what happens to the law. So, <clears throat> um, I'm headed to India. I'll get there. <laughs> Although maybe some of you see, hey, this is India. Uh, but now I want to talk about growth, and then we'll, so, so what we've gotten to is low capability means facts are fiction. Fact or fiction means the law has no traction on behavior, which means investor expectations about profitability of their actions are conditioned not on the law, but on expectations that rely on the deals that are available to them. Those are where we are so far. Now I want to shift and talk about what processes of growth look like because, um, and I think there's a graph in here somewhere. Now let me get to this graph and then come back, but maybe I cut it out. I cut it out. Okay, I have a bunch of beautiful graphs. I'm going to skip through these very fast, but the main point is the main thing that differentiates strong institution from weak institution countries is not the level of growth. Strong institution countries don't grow faster. They have less variance in growth. So if you look at the pattern of growth um, between poor countries and rich countries, this is the entire range of rich country growth rates. They all basically grew between one and a half and three. So everybody who was rich in 1960 has grown between one and a half and three and a half. Whereas here are all the countries in the world that grew slower, that grew slower than the slowest rich country, and here are all the countries that grew faster than the fastest rich country. And then there are a bunch of poor countries that grew about the same. But the point is, is it's not that this is higher or lower than this, it's that the range of this is almost an order of magnitude larger than the range of this. Okay? Then second, this variability in growth, um, uh, um, this variability of growth also comes with variability across countries and across time. So if we ask, what's the range? I'm showing you graphs you've never seen before, because meaning most graphs are like standard facts. This is the range, which is this, this is the highest growth rate a country had, less the slow, lowest rate it had. So how much did growth change in absolute terms? Which means these are um, steady countries. These are volatile countries, right? These are countries that kind of had the same rate of growth for a long time. And then these are fast countries, and these are slow countries. So this is Senegal. Senegal is a very steady growing country because it's always grown at zero, <laughs> right? It's never grown fast, it's never grown slow, right? On the other hand, Nigeria is, has you know, also grown at exactly the same rate at, as Senegal, but unlike Senegal that grew at zero by always growing at zero, Nigeria grew at 10 and then fell at 10, and then grew at 15 and then fell at 15. So it has achieved long run zero growth with a very unstable pattern, right? And kind of where countries want to be is over here. And then, by the way, the whole developed world is in here. Kind of what it means to be a developed country is being in there. 
Um, other countries are in there too, but Denmark is solidly in the, it chugged along at two and a half and did so in a pretty steady way. So, but other countries like Vietnam, Taiwan, Malaysia, Hong Kong, were out here in that they had steady rapid growth and then other countries had uh, fast growth, but it was also volatile. So China's growth was very volatile because they spent up until 1978 at a very low growth rate, and then all of a sudden they had a very high growth rate. So these countries are accelerators. These countries are kind of pretty steady growers. So the point is, is that growth is episodic, and it tends to come in bursts and then disappear. So this is Indonesia. It had this long burst for a long time. Then it had a super big crisis and then kind of recovered from the crisis, which means all of Indonesia's growth performance over the average country happened inside that growth episode. Conversely, Brazil, um, and I realize I'm showing you graphs that you have no hope of understanding in the short time I'm showing them to you, but it's the main point. The main point is um, this is the trajectory of Brazil's growth. It actually grew pretty fast right up until 1980, and then it grew at zero for 22 years, and then it took off again, which means all of Brazil's negative performance relative to the average country is concentrated in the fact that it had every long extended period of stagnation. So it's not that growth tends to be countries grow slow and countries grow fast. Countries have episodes of fast growth and episodes of slow growth, and most of the additional performance, positive or negative, of countries versus other countries gets packed into, did you have a big negative episode or did you have a big positive episode, and the rest of the time you kind of muddle around. So this is what India looks like on that exact same decomposition, but only through 2010, because we haven't updated the numbers in a long, long time. Um, uh, and by the way, these are also with Professor Carr, um, although maybe different order of authors on this one. Anyway, we, but uh, we have we have just decomposed, and basically India had kind of exactly a predicted growth from its characteristics up until '93. It had an acceleration followed by an acceleration off the acceleration, and so all of India's superior growth performance is packed into these two episodes. Right? Now, what's happened since we, we, we haven't calculated yet. So, the main thing about this, though, is that there's this steady state relationship between measures of institutions like bureaucratic quality, where rich countries have very high levels of bureaucratic quality and very high levels of GDP, but there's zero correlation between the growth rate and measures of institutions. So you don't grow fast by having good institutions. You get rich by having good institutions, or there's some steady state relationship like that. But, and, and for <laughs> other, for all the measures of kind of institutional quality, they all look like this. Strong correlation levels and levels weak correlation of changes of growth rates on levels, and no correlation at all between changes and changes. So countries don't get to faster growth by improving their institutions. This would be improving your institutions. This would be improving your growth. That would look like an upward line. This is a downward sloping line. This is a zero line. Because basically, <clears throat> institutions tend to change slow, and GDP is episodic which means you just can't explain a squiggly line with a smooth line. That's kind of a fundamental theorem of econometrics. <laughs> that you can't explain what's volatile with what's steady. Right? Um, so, uh, so what that means is we want to pay attention to the episodic nature of growth. And rules capitalism is what produces that green box of steady and moderate in which all the OECD countries are. Because what, hap what happens to the typical investor is determined primarily, not exclusively, there's no 100% rules country in the world, by the neutral application of policies. This both protects property rights and allows for creative destruction, 
because it allows the incumbent the rights to its existing profits, right? And that's kind of how capitalism is supposed to work. What happens with deals is that what happens to the typical firm or investor has little or nothing to do with the application of the policy. Facts or fiction, right? What's my tax rate? Depends on what I declare my revenues are. What are my revenues? Depends on what I can get away with, right? Um, now, in a rules, in a deals environment, closed order deals can produce rapid growth rates. What do I mean by closed order deals? I mean that I, as an investor, am taking an action on the basis of a deal I have formed, and I, I have a reasonably confident expectation that deal will come true. If I have bought into a deal in which I'd get preferential treatment, I expect that that preferential treatment will, in fact, happen and will, in fact, happen with some predictability. But they're also closed in that <laughs> The number of people for whom the favorable deal is available is known in advance by their last name. Like if I say, who, we're going to build some hotels in Sheikh al Sharm, Egypt. Who is going to build them? The set of possible people who are going to build them is known in advance by name. It's a closed deal environment. Uh, I mean, I use Egypt as an example because post Mubarak, <laughs> you can do the data. 80% of all formal sector credit went to firms connected to Mubarak. Like 80% of the banking sector outstanding loans were to firms connected to Mubarak. So if you said, who's going to get a big loan from the bank? You knew in advance who the set of people who were likely to get a loan by last name, or by first name, too. Um, you knew who they were. Um, the problem with closed order deals is all of the growth episodes we have seen in the world are by and large a move from disordered or capitalism unfriendly deals environments into closed order deals environments. It wasn't that people got to rule of law. China did not grow because China went from lack of rule of law to rule of law. <laughs> China went from an environment in which there weren't secure property rights to an environment in which property rights were secured in a particular way, and it wasn't rule of law. Um, and I think, you know, if you have a, and now I forget whether it's above or behind us, but <clears throat> if you look at, uh, you know, all of the, these are the largest, biggest, growth episodes. So these are the biggest green boxes in which is, this is the gain of the episode over the, un, you know, over what we would have expected. And basically none of these would one say, oh yes, <laughs> they moved from bad policies to rule of law and good policies. That is not Egypt of 1976. That is not Indonesia of 1967. That is not Korea of 1962. That is not Vietnam of 1989. None of these countries moved to good institutions. They moved to closed order deals in which it was clear that you could make a deal, the deal would stay done, but the set of people that were going to make those deals was kind of limited, either limited to state firms, limited to firms associated with the party, limited to a limited number of people that were in well with the government. Maybe Singapore might be an exception to that. Ireland maybe might be an exception, but it's certainly not Chile. It's certainly not most of these cases. So the problem is, and now <clears throat> I'm, the really difficult problem, therefore, is that <clears throat> you can get to rapid growth if this is kind of a space of deals world versus rules world. You can get to rapid growth by moving from disordered into closed order deals world. But the dynamics don't take you from this world to that world. Once you're in closed order deal world, the dynamics towards better institutions isn't there. Why? Because all the powerful people in the economy and hence in the politics are, and all the powerful people in politics and hence in the economy <laughs> are 
in that precisely because they are the people who are benefiting from the deal structure and the opening that deal structure to a greater number of investors or dealing with creative destruction, which is how do we liquidate it when it's made it bad investments is not a super high priority item. So um, moves in this direction um, are super hard and what might be needed to sustain growth, but they're hard because the elites don't want it. So if you say we're going to have a more dynamic economy, we're going to have a more entrepreneurial economy, new firms can arise and cause losses for existing firms and drive existing firms out of business. Mm, wait a second. Existing firms are mostly firms that had some closed order deal in connection to the existing political structure. The odds that we're going to allow the creative destruction of the new firms to destroy the old firms, the commitment to rules is a pretty tough thing to create. So, and then what often happens, and I'm going to... Uh, and hence, a lot of what you get are instances in which once you lose the previous closed order deal environment, it takes a long, long time to reconstitute a way in which investors have confidence. Because, you know, you can go after the old closed order deal. Well, let me get to that in a second. So the last idea, and then we'll... Uh, is the deals in the structure of the market uh, matrix, structure growth dynamics, which is one can think of, and again, every two by two is a little silly, but lots of two by twos are a little helpful too. One can think of high rent sectors and low rent sectors and export oriented centers and domestic market sectors. And we call people in those four sectors rentiers you know, you're exploiting natural resources to send them abroad. Power brokers, which is you're often creating monopolies in the domestic market that create favorable deals in non-traded sectors, like transport, like provision of infrastructure. You have magicians <laughs> who are export-oriented and competitive, and you have workhorses who are in the domestic market and competitive, right? And the structure of this market is if the deal structure is primarily here, you can create a boom that's ultimately self-limiting and self-delegitimizing. Because what you're doing is creating secure profits that induce investment in industries that make profits only by excluding others, what ultimately creates unfairness. I'm not calling it inequality, I'm calling it inequity because people see the people making money in this economy are making money because they're, they have access to preferential deals that impose costs on us. They're not making money because they're selling it to the rest of the world productively. They're making money on us. Whereas if you can get your deals people over here, then you can sustain a boom for a very, very long time. So part of what East Asia managed to do is not create the rule of law, but they created a, a way in which the people getting, and that, that's a terrible label for that. Um, the, uh, this is uh, uh, not well adapted, but anyway. The, the people generating exports were the people getting favorable deals. In that sense, then you can sustain a boom for a very long time because you're creating positive feedback loops for the rest of the economy. And if you then say, what do these types want in terms of policy and state capability, this you get back to the dynamics. The power brokers, <laughs> the last thing they want is open, competitive, entrepreneurial policies. The last thing they want is rules. They live on deals, and to live on deals, you have to have weak state institutions. If, in fact, the facts can be honestly and openly declared, then I can't provide myself favorable treatment by declaring the facts to be what I need them to be to generate profits. And I'm kind of being a little bit euphemistic, but not so euphemistic anybody should be confused. <laughs> Meaning, if you're making money by evading taxes, the last thing you want is a strong ability to create taxes. If you're making money by manipulating the land market, the last thing you want is a land market that's actually regulated according to the law, right? 
the workhorses are by and large the informal sector of the economy, uh, and they kind of, they just assume the government stay completely away from them because they fear it. They fear it because they fear it's controlled by these guys and it's only going to come touch them at the behest of these guys. So these guys, they want low taxes, minimal red tape, they want some good infrastructure, they basically want open order deals, they want the government out of the regulation of them entirely because they fear any regulation is being used at the expense of these. And so you have a dynamic in which you can have very rapid growth and people might say, oh look, we're having rapid growth institutions for good growth, we must be having good institutions. Completely, totally false, both in levels and changes. The growth pattern could in fact be the cause of weak and stagnant institutions because the people with power um, don't particularly care or need um, state capability. <coughs> so, um, what this means is that like, good transitions are often bad for growth, not good for growth. So if you look at what happens with the onset of democracy, and this isn't relevant to India, but this is a, illustrates a conceptual point. If you look at what happens with the onset of democracy, um, it basically causes your growth rates to collapse. So if you had high growth before democracy, your, your growth decelerates a lot. Why? Well, you often had closed order deals before democracy, and democracy moves you away from closed order deals. On the other hand, if you had really negative growth, your growth accelerates a lot with the move to democracy, in part because you were probably in a super negative closed order deal environment. And if you're in the middle, it stays about the same. So democracy is uncorrelated with growth, but in a really interesting way. It, it's uncorrelated with growth, because it reduces fast growth and increases slow growth. And I'm going to say one more thing and then stop. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, well, one more thing. Uh, basically, this is kind of how this kind of conceptual frame kind of explains everything, which is you can often get booms created by a move from a disorder to an order deals environment. But these closed order deals environment are often self-delegitimating because they depend on favorable deals in a closed way. They often create conflict over control of the state, which is meaning <laughs> if, in fact, you're generating huge rents off controlling the state, you're unlikely to be willing to let democracy and neutral process to determine who controls the state. It weakens institutions because the elites, in fact, depend for their favorable deals on institutions not being able to, in fact, enforce a neutral rules environment. Um, policy reform as practice usually has mixed effects because there's no real connection between policy de jure and what's happening to the typical firm anyway. And across the form, uh, board pushes to improve institutions like civil service reform often kind of have no impact because the elites don't really want it. So you can go through the motions and isomorph institutional reform, but Nobody's really in favor of it that has any power, and so they're often just doing just enough of it as like a stealth bomber to deflect the radar of what's really going on. In a way that, by the way, can often fool foreigners but doesn't fool domestic citizens at all, and so creates cynicism. Uh, um, and so the final thing is I just want to show kind of the difficulty of transition, which is, and this is, gets to... <laughs> uh, suppose India's growth is slowing. Now we're back to the title. Suppose India's growth is slowing um, in the current environment. One thing is let's make better and more secure deals for the existing investors so the in existing investors will continue or increase their investments which would mean a move towards more closed order deals rather than away from closed order deals. And that's what would be keep digging. Kind of what brought us to the growth that we have had was a pro-business, pro-deal nexus between the previous UPA government and the current government with slightly different sets of actors. And hence, if growth is slowing, what we need is more of what brought us growth, which is more of pro-business, closed order deals 
and less of institutional integrity. That's keep digging. <laughs> I would hesitate to recommend that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's going to be super attractive. Because if you look around and say, who's not investing? Why aren't they investing? Well, they have losses on their books. We need to clear the losses off their books. They're afraid of this. We need to secure their, you know, they're afraid of this. Let's fix that. Let's make the deals more secure, more favorable in the existing environment. Um, and the, 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 the gist of the kind of problem I have worried about is if you try and move away from the old cronies, um, what happens is <laughs> you, this is the distribution of probability in terms of both level and uncertainty, is you lower the rate of return. So if you start attacking the existing deals, you lower the rate of return to the existing cronies and increase its variance, which means you inevitably lower their propensity to invest, and they have all the money. So that's going to slow the economy. You might get a new set of potentially preferred investors that you're attracting that are good investors, and you've increased their anticipated profitability, but you've also almost certainly increased their variance. Because you say, okay, now, oh, you know, now we're going to only invest in firms that are really going to do good for the economy on a neutral basis, and we're going to follow the rule of law, and we're going to attract firms that really increase productivity and are dynamic. <laughs> But the credibility of the commitment that you're going to provide them a preferred deal has to be uncertain because, of course, you're switching from old deals to new deals. And hence, this is going to have a mixed effect on their investment because they want to invest more, but it's uncertain, right? And the workhorses, which is the most of the economy, aren't really going to see any change at all other than an increase in uncertainty. So a, trans a good transition is a very, very hard thing to pull off. Because kind of what you need, what you want, is to make the profitability of investors higher and less variance simultaneously. And you can get to higher and less variance. <laughs> That's what closed order deals do. They get to high mean, low variance for a limited and often predictable set of investors. And that, and that does, in fact, and can, in fact, produce a boom. And the idea that eliminating corruption produces booms or that good institution produce booms is just nonsense we would love to believe, but it's nonsense. Um, but the problem is once your boom has played itself out on the existing deals, the additional dynamism has to come from somewhere. And if the deals have gone into non-tradables like housing and construction, you are deeply, deeply in trouble because you're not selling it to anybody and the only other buyers are domestic. And hence, if people have been making fantastic profits off secured access to non-tradable deals, it's been a zero-sum game within the economy, more or less. And your ability to do more of that to dig your way out of the boom depends, of course, on other buyers existing for those non-tradables, which depends on the economy. So whereas if, you've, if your boom was closed or deals but structured around having to demonstrate export performance, this is why, in some sense, the deals of the deals based and the successful deals based economies have been able to be successful for a long time if in some way or another the closed order deals manage to be around some structure of having to have performance in the competitive export sectors. Does everybody get, am I being too obtuse or too bu brutal? We're about right. <laughs> I'm going to quit there. So I think the question for India is you're facing an incipient recession. How are you going to get out of it? You can think of we've got to attract, we've either got to, you know, keep digging would be, let's make the Indian economy more favorable for the existing favored investors. Or, which is the keep digging strategy, or one has to have a way of saying, how do we make India attractive in a high mean, low variance way for a new set of investors without creating lack of confidence and disruption of the existing investors, because that 
is going to lead to a massive fall, which leads to a circular thing, which even the incipient new investors are going to be unattracted by the Indian economy because it's slowed. This is like, I, I created all of that conceptual infrastructure to get to that simple kind of trade-off that I wanted to communicate. I'm done. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Lant. Um, this is always great fun to uh, be in your talks. And uh, I will respond to each of the elements of the argument from my deeply grounded Indian perspective. Okay? So I live here. I do nothing else. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to tell you what I think of when, as you were doing your talk. So let me start as fa at fact is fiction. Okay, what you, the stuff you're saying is incredibly important. And I think that all of us in India would do well to be skeptical about uh, how government agencies see the world. And uh, this extends also to public domain data sources. So I'll give you an example that about 10 years ago, uh, when my colleagues and I first started working on inflation targeting, before we went anywhere on that, our first project was to uh, cross-check the veracity of the Indian CPI. Okay, so we wrote a paper just cross-checking the weights in the CPI against a private household survey, not using any government sources. And by and large, the answer worked out, yes, the government data was okay. And then we took a large number of the price readings inside the CPI and cross-checked them against private uh, price information sources. And we found that, by and large, this works OK. So we concluded that, in India, we do measure CPI correctly, which is kind of cool. And then one could consider the policy envelope of organizing monetary policy around inflation targeting. So I think critical thinking on standard public sources of data is an important uh, requirement of working in India. And I might parenthetically say that I'm extremely nervous about everything that you did working with GDP data. <laughs> because I no longer think well of the Indian GDP data, and then I worry about the Chinese GDP data, I worry about Senegal's GDP data, okay, I worry about Angus Madison's GDP data of Aurangzeb's time, and so on. So, you know, I'm just, I'm an economist who has lost all my confidence in the world <laughs> and the universe. Um, but I want to bring public choice theory into this. Think about how governments work with data, process data, and let's not presume that uh, this is being done by some good guys, by some nice guys. Okay, let's apply uh, public choice theory. Uh, incentives of individuals inside government shape the million details about what rules are used to compute GDP. And uh, they also shape decisions about release and non-release, about uh, non-release of certain elements of a data set. And uh, so we've got to be very cautious around official data. And you know, for all of us in this community, we should be exercising much more critical thinking around it. Uh, you emphasized the problem of state legibility. For example, how does that Gujarat uh, Pollution Authority see the inflation data that uh, private firms are creating? Uh, but as you know well, when we go try to change state legibility, that very often has its own unintended consequences. So I would have added one more note to that. This does not mean that we should rush ahead with a whole raft of IT systems and IT infrastructure to give the state better. Because when the state actually sees the people more effectively, this may induce great harm upon the people. So there are many good things to be said about a state that knows less about us. <laughs> So again, we as economists have a vested interest in data, and we tend to see data as a good thing. And we are always ready to support engineers like Praveen, who have worked on improving state legibility. And I think that all of us today should be far more cautious before we're willing to place information into the hands of a state. Okay? Information is a very dangerous thing. State legibility has unintended consequences. Can I? Yes, yes, of course. This trip to India, I have come up with a new phrase for that. Okay. You don't make Pinocchio into a real boy by adding more strings. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Now I come to number two, which is about the beautiful law. So uh, I want to say three things which 
are versions of what you say, and I completely disagree. Okay, so your version is that the beautiful law is the good law. Okay, and I think in the back of your mind, the beautiful law is you know something nice that worked in the UK. Okay, uh, the Indian phrase that all of us are very used to is that in India we have great laws and we have terrible implementation. Okay, so this is an Indian version of that similar proposition, and I want to disagree with both these propositions. Okay, so now let's drill deeper into what is a law and why some laws work and some laws don't. Um, in a constitutional democracy, the law authorizes coercion. Okay, so it is not okay for a government to ask me to wear a blue shirt if the legislature has not enacted a law which gives the power to some official to investigate me and find out that I was actually not wearing a blue shirt and then impose a certain penalty on me. Okay, that's our vanilla notion of a constitutional democracy. I want to go further into public choice theory and public choice problems. Uh, the law empowers the executive. It empowers officials inside the government to investigate, to raid, to uh, indict, to prosecute, and ultimately through some judicial process to award penalties. It is equally the job of the law to put checks and balances on that. And I think there we economists have been wrong. We economists think of policy as inflation targeting. We economists think of policy as should you have a certain kind of income tax structure. But it is terribly important to think about administration and income tax administration is shaped and controlled by income tax administration law. It is the law, it is the text of the law that defines and circumscribes what an income tax inspector can do. Does an income tax inspector require a warrant before he raids your house? Does an income tax inspector have the ability to file charges against you? What kind of judicial hearing takes place? As an example, in India, when the early stages of the judicial hearings about income tax take place, the so-called judge is an income tax officer. Okay? So you're not going to do very well in that. Okay, so let me uh, take securities law as an example. This is a field that I know best. Uh, in my uh, group at NIPFP, Pratik is here, we've invented a phrase which we find very useful. We think about the invisible infrastructure. Okay? So when we look at the United States SEC, the United States SEC does not operate in isolation. It operates in the context of many, many pieces of institutional infrastructure. These are the in invisible infrastructure that makes an SEC rule about venture capital work. And what we do wrong as economists is we take interest in economics, so we are keen on understanding how does the SEC deal with this problem in venture capital. But we fail to see that invisible infrastructure. Now let me run through some of that in invisible infrastructure. Uh, when a hearing takes place at the SEC, which is like a trial, that trial takes place in front of a person who's a judge. He's called an administrative law judge, but he's a part of the judiciary. The United States Constitution demands separation of powers, that you cannot fuse all three of legislative, executive, and judicial functions into one organization. So it is not possible for an SEC staff person to play judge for a day. Okay? In India, we do not have this infrastructure. So it is an official of the SEBI who plays judge when a trial takes place at SEBI. And we believe that about 90% of the cases heard at SEBI result in a guilty outcome. Okay? Now, this places tremendous discretionary power in the hands of a SEBI official who can threaten a private person that if I investigate you, your goose is cooked because I have the discretion of who to investigate. I have the discretion of uh, prosecuting you. And if I prosecute you, there's a 90% chance that you will lose. Okay? This entire invisible infrastructure of how the US SEC works is absent in India. Similarly, when you think of the role played by the state law enforcement in the United States, sorry, in New York, about commercial law, when you think of the role played by the Southern District of New York of the Department of Justice in New York, all these come together to create the outcomes that we see. But when we economists think about the United States SEC, we think in terms of high economics, and that misses the essence of it. Now, what would a good law be? A good law would then be something that forces the separation of powers inside the Indian SEBI, that creates due process for how an investigation will begin, how a prosecution will take place, what kind of punishments would you engage in. Okay. Now I want to riff on your theme about load-bearing. Think about the 
a lack of alignment between the incentives of an individual inside the organization and the purported objectives of the organization. One of the most important sources of premature load bearing is high coercive power. Is the power to raid, is the power to put you into jail. So the analogy I will make is that if you're going to embark on having a red light and having a policeman judge the state of nature that you have bust a red light and have a fine of a million rupees, that's going to generate organizational route. And the way to control that is the perfect law where the fine is set to 100 rupees. Okay? So it is critical that these features have to be in the law. So what you call a perfect law, I disagree. I would say that a perfect law is one that is deeply grounded in public choice theory, that thinks deeply about administrative law, that thinks about checks and balances surrounding the bureaucracy, is actually almost entirely outside the domain of a normal economics discussion about the public distribution system or fertilizer subsidy. Or that's a different kind of economic policy. So a perfect law that embedded rules about the PDS, but which did not pay attention to the incentive alignment of the individuals inside government agencies that would enforce the law is actually not a perfect law, it's a terrible law. So we would define a perfect law as one that is deeply grounded in public choice theory, that thinks through implementation, that creates those checks and balances, that reduces the discretionary and coercive power of individuals inside government. And then you have a ghost of a chance. Okay? And we, we recognize it's hard. We recognize that building state capacity is a long, slow process. But this is the way we would think about uh, what is a perfect law? And my colleagues and I at NIPFP have spent about 10 years mm -hmm. fighting these kinds of questions and most often coming out on the losing side. Mm -hmm. But still, this is how we think about the world. Okay, next I'd like to go to rules and deals. Um, first, I want to tell you an anecdote. Uh, in 2002, after a long battle, uh, Rakesh Mohan is not here. He was the hero who led the charge on removing small-scale sector exemption. Okay, so there were a couple of hundred industries in India where production could only be done by small-scale firms. Okay? Now, I happen to know something about a large biscuit company <laughs> where biscuits were reserved for the small-scale sector. Okay? So all the production of this company was organized around a large number of external contractors who each of them were small companies. And so this company would develop the product and have the brand name and have the advertising campaign, but they couldn't produce. Production was fragmented across a large number of subscale firms. The law changed in 2002. It took 10 years for this firm to adjust its capital stock. Okay? It turns out that it's efficient for them to do about 70% internally, about 30% through contracting out to large firms, and 70% internally in large firms, whatever. So they figured out what's optimal for them, but under some kind of quadratic capital adjustment process, it took them a full 10 years to reach the long run outcome that they would have desired. Okay? And this emphasizes the lack of value of deals. Because on a 10-year horizon, the counterparty in government with whom I would make a deal isn't that useful. Okay, so I want to say, at the Indian stage of capitalism, at the level of the large firms of India, the stakes are very high and the time horizons are very large. And so there is something fundamentally unattractive about a deals approach what people really crave is predictability and rule of law. So I don't share this concept that the big Indian companies are consummate deal makers. Actually, it is not in their interest at that, sta at that scale. Okay, the second reason why these firms think more like you would is uh, the work that you've done, you remember, on capitalization. Okay? For a large Indian company today, it is absolutely essential to be in the Forbes list of rich people. I've got to sell my company. And for me to be able to sell my company, for me to be on the list of rich people, I have to have a transferable notion of wealth. Once again, a deal's equilibrium is no fun because it's not transferable. I mean, I'll enjoy it while I can. Inside my own shop, I'll do well. But the market will simply not NPV that to a good number. So once again, the Indian bourgeoisie at an early stage of India's per capita GDP has reached that minimum complexity and the scale of operation where actually a pure deals-based solution you know, is not very attractive. What they crave is uh, the long term. And again, elections are a part of that story. Because India got to liberal democracy early, and elections generate repeated changes in government, no deal solution really has a horizon beyond a couple of years. Because there is a decent chance that a union government, at the state government, 
there will be a next election and the incumbent will lose so once again a deal works for a short time and then things can change so from the viewpoint of the indian capitalist deals are actually very risky things okay, so deals don't induce that kind of warmth and comfort and i'll come back to this in a moment on understanding the indian story about the boom and uh, the mediocre growth that has happened i want to talk about one more element of that i, I like the f i like to play with the phrase in my mind policy as an incomplete contract okay so we economists have done a lot of work on incomplete contracts as applied to between private people but we should think about policy a stated policy as an incomplete contract between the government and private persons okay it's an incomplete contract for two reasons first just like private contracts don't cover all states of nature no stated law covers all states of nature so there are always residual states of nature that are going to come back and surprise us and then the private person is always left holding that uncertainty that what are you going to do in that incomplete state when that state arises because the law did not define the mapping from state of nature to action and so what's going to happen further the way laws are structured in a liberal democracy the law can always be changed by the legislature so laws are fundamentally uncertain for a private person in a way that private counterparties feel safe so if you write a contract on me and we have a 20 year term on that contract i will take you to common law courts when you renege on that contract mm -hmm. the legislature in contrast has no obligation to not renege because they can just enact a new law tomorrow so the level of uncertainty which private persons face when faced with a state is vastly greater than our conventional economics discourse about incomplete contracting between private persons because of these two things first is a traditional notion that there are states of nature that are not covered second the government can just change the law tomorrow because you've just got to get it through the legislature i'll give an example there are many so called fintech firms who are trying to do innovative computer technology new kinds of information and all that so a couple of hundred firms in india got going trying to build a uh, new kind of uh, financial activities using modern novel information sets and lo and behold a couple of months ago the rbi came out with a new law which said that if you're a fintech company you cannot use data from credit bureaus you're cut off from credit bureaus and this is pretty destructive to the entire business model of credit bureaus okay similarly uh, there is a private firm that is called billdesk which built a business of processing bills okay so all of us have many bills and they would do a lot of tedious work for us to make it easy for us to pay our bills mm -hmm. and then the government came up and set up a monopoly bill processing company and so they lost their business model okay this is the kind of risk that firms in india face and it is in the interest of firms to get to a state which has an economic philosophy and some principles to deal with this policy as an incomplete contract because you'll never be able to write down a contract that will hold for any length of time so where the deals of policy and i'm saying policy as legitimate law in either case it is a very high level of uncertainty for the private sector and this goes close to the indian experience of boom and decline and i'll come back to that in a moment um on your last component on growth mm. um so my colleagues and i have spent uh many many years on this subject ela started on this subject in 1995 or something okay and uh, i just want to briefly summarize our thought process on the long time series of indian growth you missed the fun part you stopped in 2010 okay the really interesting stuff happens after 2010 <laughs> okay uh here's our understanding point 1 we have constructed all our macroeconomics knowledge without the use of gdp data okay and any <laughs> technique yes at nipfp okay so to do technically sound macro in india you've got to get away from dubious data okay our understanding of the facts runs like this there is a rather nice and tame normal business cycle in india it's surprising how much it looks like the business cycle phenomenon of other emerging markets it's surprising how much it looks like the business cycle phenomenon in the united states okay so if you looked at the pure cycle a good cycle estimator it looks astonishingly normal <laughs> i it took me many years to come to terms with this proposition because i my prior was whatever it is it'll be different from anywhere else in the world okay because this country is unlike any other okay so i take that back the business cycle as in percentage deviation from the trend yeah. is actually very tame its spectral properties everything it's normal it's nice yeah. however what's weird is that there are large changes in trend growth okay so like in the united states trend growth is extremely stable yeah. okay and that's kind of what you're saying yeah, yeah. that there are these growth episodes and there are right, right, right. there is periods of high growth and there are periods of low growth and i think what the stuff that you're doing will come out even more clearly if you first purge out the business cycle phenomenon 
Okay, a lot of what you are doing is obscured because you're mixing up cycle and trend. What is remarkable? That's yes. Not true. I think because the technique that we use uses an eight-year period. Okay. It Fine. Well, we have tried to cope with that. But okay. The point, the point, I think, is going to be yeah. So anyway. when we purge out the cycle and we purge out the short-term fluctuations, and you're left with the trend, right. and what we see is dramatic changes in trend growth. Most notably, there was a sharp decline in trend growth in about 2011. Okay, so India got a great boom 1991 to 2011, and then there's been a sharp decline in growth after 2011. And the great question that all of us are grappling in is what changed, what went wrong. Uh, so here's an interesting sharp number, appropriately measured private investment hit a turning point at 2011 and has declined in nominal terms after 2011. Hmm. Okay, so live alone real growth, there's been a nominal negative growth from 2011 onwards. And that's the grand question of the age, um, what happened. By the way, you use the term episode. May I suggest you need to find a different phrase because the, at least my understanding of the Queen's English is that an episode is two months, three months, two years, three years. But as we're actually dealing with grand phenomena, and I think we need to find an appropriate vocabulary for the scale of the problem that is being seen. As I said, the dates in India are 1991 to 2011 is the great boom, and 2011 to 2019 is the hard times, and these are not short episodes, they are deeper changes, so we need to find an appropriate phrase. I think one, the yeah. private investment point, yeah. it's using your own data, not GDA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, I turn to India and your comments at the end. Uh, so, um, in, uh, a, in a famous book called Building State Capacity, uh, <laughs> you, you show some evidence on institutional quality and uh, I was very intrigued and struck by the fact that uh, your data points for India are 1996 and 2012, and over that period, institutional quality declined. Okay? It is so interesting that in that period of that great boom, actually, the institutional quality in India was declining. Okay? And my uh, story about what was going on runs something like this. GDP grew from 0.3 trillion to 2 trillion. Okay? There was a vast increase in GDP, there was a vast increase in the size of the private sector, the biggest firms became truly gigantic. Mm -hmm. um, it is hard to even comprehend the meaning of the word 10 trillion rupees, which is the market cap of Reliance today. Reliance Industries today is a 10 trillion rupee company. That's $150 billion of market cap in a poor country like India. These are staggering numbers. Similarly, TCS okay, is a $100 billion market cap and so on. These are gigantic firms that have come to operate in India. A lot of uh, money was thrown at manipulating policy okay, because the stakes went up. So when we were a $0.3 trillion GDP, the stakes were smaller. When we became a $2 trillion GDP, the stakes were much higher. And the institutions crumbled under that load that was placed on them. Okay? So we didn't do a whole lot in terms of building institutions. And I remain an un unreconstructed optimist on the hard work of building institutions. For example, you, know, you make, the work, make the courts work better. I have no doubt at all that in India, if we improved the working of the courts, that would be good for the economy. So I don't share your concern about traditional conceptions of institution building and their relevance in India. It's just that those things were not done in this great boom. And uh, every bug in the legal system was then exploited with great ferocity and tenacity by people who had much more at stake. So private persons had much more at stake. Uh, the institutions had intermediate private conflicts which could be the courts, which could be policy debates. These institutions were not able to handle that higher load that was placed on them. Uh, th there is and was an old Indian instinct for central planning, and that central planning turned into a venal version where uh, private persons were lobbying with the government official, either in a department of government or now in the regulators, to change the policy to suit myself. So again, there was this problem in the old India of the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. Okay. In 1991, we thought we were supposed to do economic freedom. Actually, we created a new class of central planners, the regulators, who control every little detail of product and process. And these same political economy pressures with 10x the money came to trying to influence the behavior of these organizations. And that started becoming this new battleground. Finally, we had a lack of rule of law in the agencies, in the law enforcement, in income tax, the sort of stuff I've described to you, the powers to investigate, the powers to raid, the powers to imprison. Uh, there are draconian powers littered all over Indian laws, and the 
uh, individuals inside agencies started using these powers. And that's my story about how by around 2011, the private sector lost hope. So in 1991, the private sector felt hope that India was becoming a normal country. I want to use Andre Schleifer's phrase. It, that is exactly the story of what happened in 91. I moved back to India in 1993, and I wish I had the turn of phrase to invent that word then. The dream in the eyes of the private sector in India in the early 90s was that we're now going to become a normal country. Okay? And that gave confidence that, yeah, we will have some problems, but let's give it time. Things are getting fixed. The policy will get better. The agencies will get better. The institutions will get better. And uh, by the period of 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, the private sector took a good hard think at itself, at, looked at the world and said, you know, I really don't feel good about what's going on. Here's an example about what you call the magicians. These are the export-oriented firms, okay? So consider the firms in India who make software, who do knowledge process outsourcing, uh, Microsoft who operates in India. All these firms have to deal with the Indian tax authorities, okay? By the way, the Indian tax authorities think that about a third of Microsoft's global profit should be paid to them because about a third of Microsoft's global users are located in India. Okay, so these things happen. When you are a magician operating in the export sector, you have to deal with the institutions as they are placed in the country in front of you. Uh, similarly, a large number of the magicians, the firms in India, are organizing themselves as legal persons that operate outside India. Mm. Because to be a company in India is to be exposed to the Indian enforcement apparatus. So you're safer being a company in Singapore and just having a sterile office in India, having as little engagement with Indian institutions as possible. And that has adverse consequences. So I will stick with an unreconstructed claim that building institutions will help, and building institutions is essential for the turnpike to growth. Okay. We need to debate how to, do, how to get there. And I'm also not as gloomy as you about the interests of the elite. As I said to you, I think that the bourgeoisie in India does not want this level of risk. It boils down to an expropriation risk. And uh, the bourgeoisie will always be happier if they have a disproportionate seat on the table. But my opinion and my reading of India today is that the bourgeoisie has understood that the rule of law is actually their greatest savior. Okay. Thank you.